Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is approaches to the problem. You've heard a lot about the problem of antibiotic resistance already, but now I want to talk about the types of approaches that have been, uh, are being done at CARE, the Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research, and also worldwide. In some of these, of course, you've heard about throughout the course, but I'm going to highlight a few newer things that are exciting, I think. So first of all, the uh, EU has split up the types of approaches that need to be done to deal with antibiotic resistance into six different categories. And these categories are therapeutics, diagnostics, surveillance, transmission, environment, and interventions. And you've heard about most of these a little bit, but I'm going to put them in a little bit of a framework. CARE at uh, Gothenburg University is organized in, along these themes as well. So we have each of the themes. In addition, we have education and outreach, and that's why we're doing this course. And we have members from a large number of different faculties at the university that are associated with all of these. Uh, so I'm going to start with therapeutics. I'm going to give you a, a definition and then give you a couple of cool examples, I think. So therapeutics essentially is finding new antibiotics. How do we find new antibiotics? And you have one lecture about this. But in general, natural products or their derivatives are the main source of at least half of the drugs in use today. And for that reason, a lot of effort is on natural products. And this kind of approach needs multidisciplinary research. You need biologists who will find new sources of antibiotics, who will initially find initial uh, hints that this might work as an antibiotic, which are then given to chemists who can modify these compounds and make them better, so they work better. They then go back to the biologists who continue to test them and see what uh, works the best, and back and forth like this. Until you have a very good candidate where it's then passed on to medical professionals for, for example, animal testing and further human testing. So many antibiotics are produced, though, by microorganisms. But only about 1% of microorganisms can be grown in the lab. So if you go out to the ocean and you pick up 100 bacteria, only one will grow in the lab. And in large part, that's because we don't know how to grow them. So it was mentioned briefly uh, during Morton's talk that there is a recent invention to try to deal with this problem. And this is something called the eye chip. The eye chip looks like this. If you look here, it's very small. It's about uh, six, eight centimeters long. And it has a lot of little holes. What you do is you take a sample of bacteria from anywhere, the ocean, the soil, whatever it might be, and you dilute it so that when you put this device in that solution, only one bacteria on average goes into each of those little holes. Okay? So you have like many, many, many test tubes for each bacteria. Then on top of that, you put these filters, and they are uh, membranes that allow nutrients to go in and out, but the bacteria are caught. So you have one membrane on the bottom and one membrane on the top. And then this device is all screwed together, and this is called the eye chip. What do you do with it? Why do you do this? So let's say I took a sample of soil, and I diluted it, put it in this device. Then what one does is bury that eye chip in the right environment where those bacteria really grow. Because we don't know what they need to grow, but it's whatever it is, it's in the environment where we got them. 
So you bury it in there. And in the experiments that uh, they've used this for, they leave it for, let's say, a month, a couple of weeks, they let it grow. Then what these researchers did is, this is hard to see, but they took that eye chip, they washed off the mud, and then overlaid it with bacteria. They took bacteria in a gel and put it on top of the eye chip without opening it up, incubated it with uh, these bacteria. In this case, it was Staphylococcus aureus. Left it to grow for some period of time. And what you could see is at certain locations in the chip, the bacteria, Staph aureus, didn't grow, indicating that there might be an antibiotic being produced by that bacteria. They then went back in, identified that bacteria, and eventually got this compound, which uh, Morton talked about briefly, Texa, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, to be honest, Texabactin. And Texabactin is really interesting because it has two targets in the bacterial cell, which makes it less likely to evolve resistance. Another type of environment being looked at, and this just came out in the last week, is they looked at bacteria associated with the root nodules of plants. And this is one particular plant. And they found that it produced an antibiotic that killed off bad bacteria that could affect the plant. So now they're in the process of identifying that antibiotic and seeing whether it might be useful either for plants to use as a general way of controlling disease in plants, or possibly later in uh, humans. Another therapeutic approach is shown here. It's resensitizing the bacteria to become sensitive again to the antibiotic. So there are a number of beta-lactam inhibitors that are being developed. This shows one. And by now, if you've been listening in this course, you should recognize that square structure there, which means it looks a bit like an antibiotic. It looks enough like an antibiotic that uh, the beta-lactamases will bind to it. It doesn't actually act as a very good antibiotic, though. But you inhibit beta-lactamase, and then all of a sudden they're sensitive again to beta-lactams. And recently, a new one has come out that people are very excited about called ETX 1317. And it inhibits uh, beta-lactamases of ESBL bacteria. Right now, it can only be used in IV treatment intravenously, but people are hoping they're, new, they're working on a new oral version of the drug. The last kind of thing I want to talk about in therapeutics has to do with the microbiome. The microbiome are the bacteria that grow on you. Uh, they grow in all parts of you. The major source in the gut, of course, but also the skin, etc. In recent years, there is paper after paper after paper associating the microbiome, the composition, the bacteria that are in the microbiome with a large number of diseases. I just want to highlight, though, that a lot of this is very new. It's not that clear how clear the connection is between any particular disease and the microbiome. But there are more and more and more indications. But one place where the microbiome actually has become a therapy is in Clostridium difficile infection. So if you take antibiotics... Uh, if you take a broad-spectrum antibiotic, you often lose all the bacteria in your gut or many of the bacteria in your gut. When that happens, certain bacteria, for example, C. difficile, can take over. And if you get sick with C. difficile, it's very hard to treat. It's very resistant to antibiotics. It causes long-term diarrhea and painful um, stomach, et cetera, or gut, et cetera. One of the current treatments for this is actually a fecal microbiota transfer. 
So you take the microbiota from another healthy person and repopulate the gut.